welcome back to My Bolt EV. This is Jim. We're going from point A to point B. Today's episode is entitled simply, Why an EV Jim? If you want to understand, stick around. If you want to bury your head in the sand and stick with your horse and buggy, go ahead and exit. Let's go ahead and start. Since I like to be organized, today we're just going to talk about the facts. It's organized in six parts, an introduction and a conclusion, and then four points that we need to talk about in between. The sources of misinformation about EVs is one of the great things that we need to talk about. And then there are three great debates, the carbon footprint debate, the charger availability debate, and the we need more electricity debate. We're going to get into all of these. Let's talk about the reality of electric cars. Way back in the early 1900s, a man by the name of Henry Ford invented something that would replace the typical family's horse and buggy. It was called the automobile. And when Ford first started pushing these mechanical beasts into the public, there was an outcry from buggy manufacturers, horse breeders, feed suppliers. They screamed, we don't need an automobile. We have a perfectly good horse and buggy. In 1900, there was only one car per about 10,000 people here in the United States. In 1910, that number was five cars per 1,000. And by 1920, there were almost 90 cars per 1,000 people. And today, there are almost as many cars as there are people here in the United States. In 2011, at the beginning of the EV revolution, there were only 16,000 EVs in the United States of America. By November of 2021, there were over 2 million. That is a 125-fold increase in 10 years. To say that the USA cannot have a fleet of electric cars that is mostly battery electric vehicles in the next 10 to 20 years is to ignore history. Even a modest 50-fold increase over the next 10 years will put 100 million battery electric vehicles on the road by 2032. To think otherwise is ludicrous, and it's also an insult to the American spirit of ingenuity and determination. This video is to provide simple information and help eliminate the worries about what is happening in the automotive industry. I am neither pro-EV or anti-ICE. I'm smart enough to realize there's a need for more infrastructure to make the battery electric vehicle a new norm. I don't think we should go around closing gas stations before everything is placed. Nor do I believe that we will be able to eliminate fossil fuels as quickly as those of a more liberal ilk would advocate for. I'm a realist. I know that it will take time, but sitting around bemoaning the fact that you don't agree with EVs is a ludicrous attitude. Okay, let's go into the first debate, the great carbon footprint debate. Here are a few numbers regarding the carbon footprint necessary to manufacture and own a battery electric vehicle. Carbon footprint to manufacture an EV compared to an ICE vehicle is very, very telling. For a typical Ford F-150, it takes 9,830 kilograms of carbon emissions to build the vehicle. Compared that to a Tesla Model 3, it's only it's 17,690 kilograms. So you can see that it's much more carbon to build an EV than it is to build a typical ICE vehicle. The carbon footprint per mile for the most popular vehicles in their class, the Ford F-150, 410 grams per mile, while the Tesla Model 3 is only 110 grams per mile. At 100,000 miles, the total carbon emissions for a Ford F-150, 41,000 kilograms. For a Tesla Model 3, 11,000 kilograms. And by the time you get to the totals at 150,000 miles, the Ford F-150 has used 156,918 kilograms of carbon, while the Tesla Model 3 is half that, 75,218. The break-even point is about 26,212 miles. It is at that point the lifetime carbon emissions of both vehicles are identical. 
at 26,000 miles. At 150,000 miles, the normal end of life for most ICE vehicles, the battery electric vehicle has half the lifetime carbon footprint. Let's take a look at a couple of additional carbon footprint considerations. The equations that we used earlier don't take into consideration these two simple facts. Fact one, some of the charging for battery electric vehicles will come from renewable energy sources, hydro, wind, and solar primarily, so that lowers the carbon footprint even more. And fact number two is that 90% of all battery electric vehicles are charged during the overnight hours during off-peak periods using electrical power that is generated to keep the grid online. So that power is being generated anyway, it's just not being used. That electricity is that which the electrical generation facilities must keep active to make your electricity available the next morning. So that carbon was going to be emitted anyway. So we're also going to talk about some of the false facts that are floating around on social media about how much material is moved to make one battery electric vehicle. The American Free Press did a fact check, and I'm going to provide a link to that in the data below the video. The second great debate in the battery electric vehicle debate is, I don't have a place to charge my car. I can tell you that is the number one complaint that I hear from anybody I talk to about battery electric vehicles. But it just is not true. Here are some startling facts. Fact number one, there are 71.8 million homes in the U.S. that have clothes dryers. And more than 90% of those are electric. The electrical outlet for the clothes dryer is all you need to charge your battery electric vehicle. And if you drive less than 25 miles a day, you can charge it on a standard 110 volt outlet overnight and be done with it. Fact number two, there are more than 91,500 level two public chargers and 21,600 DC fast chargers in the USA in the year ending 2021. And that has increased even more. There was an in increase of 18% in level two chargers from 20 20 to 2021 and a 24% increase in DC fast chargers during that same period. The level 2 charger can serve 12 cars per day averaging 2 hours charging per charger and the DC chargers can serve 48 cars per day for average usage. 95% of all EV owners right now have a charger installed in their home. And fact number four, you do not need to charge your car every day. You don't. The number of charges in the USA will grow exponentially every single day. Tesla will be opening up their network to non-Tesla vehicles over the next two years. Tesla is also opening up their proprietary charging adapter for use by other companies in their cars, free of charge. We will have to wait and see which of the VHS versus beta uh, argument will win. Who's going to win? The DC fast charge using the CCS charger or the DC fast charge from Tesla? Don't know. But I'm telling you now that charging at home is the easiest way to charge. In Europe, they also have a no-show charging station in a lot of major cities. The owner will simply bring their charging cable, plug it into the plug that's on the street and plug their car in and charge away. There's simply no way an owner of a battery electric vehicle cannot find a place to charge their car today. It's a, a moot point. I have three figures that I'm going to show you and we'll talk about those in more detail in the next segment. Okay, the first figure we're going to talk about is the CCS network, the DC fast charge network. This picture shows the DC fast chargers across the southeastern United States. Basically, they follow most of the major interstates and cover most of your metropolitan areas. The second is the Tesla network, which is also in the southeastern United States. And you can see, again, they follow the interstate networks. And keep in mind, Tesla is going to open up about 10% of all their chargers everywhere to non-Tesla vehicles. And then finally, here in central Florida, I'm never more than... 
20, 30, 40 miles away from a DC fast charger. And there are literally hundreds of level two chargers that I'm not even showing in this map. Number three, I'm not gonna go into any great detail on, but number three in the great debate is we need more electricity. Well, as I have already mentioned, a lot of charging takes place during the overnight hours, during the off-peak periods when power is being generated anyway and, and just goes to waste keeping the lines charged. So as of 2021, there were 2 million electric cars in the United States and there was absolutely zero impact to the electrical grid. 2 million cars, zero impact. At 100 million, we might need two to three additional uh, power stations across the United States to c cover the uh, extra charging. But it's not going to be as massive as all the experts are saying. And you also have to take into consideration a lot of the people who are driving EVs right now also have solar installed on their home. So they're not taking anything from the grid at this point in time. Here is just one more thing to add to the requirements for more power, electrical power here in the United States. In 2019, according to the EPA, the United States consumed 142.8 billion gallons of gasoline. And the EPA says that one gallon of gasoline is equivalent to 33.8 kilowatt hours. This means there were 4.8 trillion kilowatt hours available in gasoline in 2019. EVs are four times more efficient at a minimum than a gasoline powered car. So that means if we converted every car right now to electric, we would only need between 800 billion and 1.9 trillion kilowatt hours added to the electrical grid. We're already producing 4.2 trillion kilowatt hours per year in the United States. Adding that small amount is trivial. I want to thank you for stopping by today and listening to what I have to say about electric vehicles. I also want to tell you that I have been an electric vehicle owner for almost four years now, so I have practical experience at how it affects your electricity bill and how it affects your income and how it affects your travels more so than any of the people you hear from places like Prager University where they call in Mark Mills who's a supposed expert on this. He's a, a fellow with the Manhattan Institute and if you know anything about the Manhattan Institute it is fully funded by big oil. So this man, being paid for by Big Oil, comes over to Prager University and makes these grandiose videos about the fallacies of owning an electric vehicle. He has no clue. He is no more educated about this than I am. He just has the backing of Big Oil to pay for it and someone like Dennis Prager giving him a platform to talk about it on. And it's just all a load of manure. The fact is, Electric vehicles are coming. There's not a thing you or I can do about it. We can whine and cry about it, and we can take it to the bank. They're coming, and there's nothing nothing anybody's going to do to stop them. And they are more energy efficient than gas-powered vehicles. Gasoline is 125-year-old technology. 125 years, folks. It's time for us to move out of the 19th century into the 21st century and treat our planet and each other like we matter. Fossil fuels are finite, period. Electricity we can get for the next 10,000 years off of wind, off of solar, off of nuclear. There are so many sources for making electricity that don't involve fossil fuels that we should be investigating now. Thanks for stopping by. And if you don't mind, subscribe, share, comment, and like. And if you want to be notified of future videos, click the notification bell. 
I will be reading all of your comments, and I do appreciate you taking the time to listen to this one. Thank you.